Economics is all about modeling. And I'm not talking about my failed catwalk career or the collection of Starfleet ships that I keep on my person at all times. We use models to explore and experiment with the way things work. You'd never launch a rocket without testing a model first, would you? And just like rockets and starships and haute couture, Economists use models to help them understand how exactly our economy operates. That's because, as a social science, economics is the study of human behavior, meaning it's filled with complexities and eccentricities because... humans. <laughs> so in order to examine the systems that drive our world, sometimes we actually have to remove them from reality and explore how they'd work in a simplified world without all those messy people getting in the way. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is study hall, macroeconomics. What? What, no, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm smizing. Let's, let's just get to the theme music. So models are the bread and butter of economics, or bread and Nutella, if that's more your thing. Explaining the tricky inner workings of our systems all in a neat model package. And one of the classic economic models of a market economy is the circular flow model, which explains how goods, services, and money circulate freely between households and businesses. And while it may seem simple, it's kind of the point of a model, it lets us gain insights into the most basic relationships of our economic ecosystem. Because the circular flow model is, you know, a circle, there isn't one place to start. But for our purposes, we can jump in with businesses or firms if you wanna get fancy about it. This is pretty much anyone who sells a product, which are goods and services, including my models of the Starship Enterprise. Firms sell products to households in exchange for money or revenue. In economics, a household is just one or more people living in the same home. So it could be your family or extended family or your roommates or just you and your six cats. But money doesn't grow on trees and neither do model starships or, you know, any other product. Firms need factors of production like land, labor, and capital to make the stuff we love to buy. They can get these factors of production on the factor market from, you guessed it, households. Individuals and households can sell land, labor, and other factors of production to firms in exchange for money. Or, as most people understand it, you work hard and you get paid. What you're really doing when you clock into your shift at the Olive Garden is selling your labor to a firm who needs it to continue providing their world-famous goods and services. In this case, bottomless breadsticks. You can then use your precious hourly wage, plus tips, to buy your own goods and services on the product market. The product market is the exchange of households' money for firms' goods and services. It's one of the most familiar economic exchanges. I give you money, you give me a product. The money paid to firms by households for these goods and services is the revenue firms can turn around and put right back into the factor market. Importantly, even though it sometimes feels like your boss owns your soul, each household actually owns their own factors of production. That's right. And even though my heart and soul technically belongs to Susanna Hoffs, I own my own ability to work. And maybe someday I'll own land too if I give up impulse buying new running shoes and energy gels. And while we usually think of businesses as being huge, all-powerful entities, they wouldn't get very far without those precious factors of production, like labor that they buy from households. Which is why some workers are able to negotiate higher wages and better benefits from their employers. Firms need these factors of production to make those products we love to buy, and hey, We've been here before. The whole point of the circular flow model is that everyone and everything in our economic ecosystem is connected. From my next door neighbor, to my high school principal, to my one true love, Susanna Hoffs, from new cars to overpriced Japanese thermal hair straightening treatments, to tacos. Welcome to Martha's Taco Shop. Martha makes the best tacos in town, including birria on the weekends. Martha's tacos are Byron's absolute favorite, so every Taco Tuesday, he makes sure to hit her up. Byron works at the local trampoline park, Catch Air, making sure that hordes of screaming children absolutely do not push, shove, or turn the forbidden backflip somersault, and he has the paycheck and the migraines to prove it. So he sells his labor in the factor market to Catch Air in return for wages, which then flow through his household on down to the product market where he buys Martha's tacos. Now. Martha makes her tacos using locally sourced meat and veggies. It's one of the reasons they're so good. 
So Martha has been hanging out in the factor market too, buying Farmer Zev's chicken, pork, and goat, and Farmer Noman's cilantro and onions. These count as land resources from Zev and Noman, respectively. So Byron's wages flow from catch air, through the factor market, to his household, then to the product market where he exchanges them for delicious tacos. Martha then uses that money to cover the cost of the factors of production she needs to make her tacos, paying it out to Noman and Zev. And once that money hits their bank accounts, the two of them can put it right back into the product market to pay for their own goods and services. Noman invests in a Snuggie while Zev buys a new collar for his beloved pet goat, Definitely not for future eating. And on we go. But the circular flow model encompasses more than tacos, trampoline parks, and snuggies. It explains the inner workings of an entire national economy, including a great big spender we haven't even mentioned yet. It isn't a business, or a household, or even the billionaires who want to build a space colony. It's the government. Yes, even under capitalism, the government is a huge participant in the economy. Since the government is Theoretically, in the business of keeping things running, it participates in the economic flow too. In the free market, the government acts something like a firm or a company. While the government doesn't technically sell goods and services the way most businesses do, they do take in revenue via taxes, like income and property taxes from households and excise and corporate taxes from businesses. Well, <clears throat> some businesses, at least in theory. The government uses this revenue to provide crucial goods and services to the public, things like roads and schools, just like Martha provides her crucial tacos to the town. The government also uses tax revenue to buy things from businesses, those fighter jets don't make themselves, and to pay for labor on the factor market to fill those bureaucratic jobs, like teachers, librarians, politicians, and Doris, the lady who takes your really unflattering DMV photo. The money spent by firms and the government on labor in the factor market the income households receive, the money they then spend in the product market, and the revenue taken in by businesses are all examples of variables because, well, they vary. In economics, we can call anything that changes rate or quantity a variable. And in economics, things are always changing. But not all variables are created equal, or at least they're not measured in the same way. All of the variables in the circular flow diagram are conveniently called flow variables which means they're measured over a period of time, like a month or a year. Flow variables are things like yearly tax revenue, monthly consumption, weekly taco purchases, and of course, costs, income, consumption, and revenue. Another flow variable used to measure the health of the economy is the annual GDP, or gross domestic product. We'll get there, don't worry. Stock variables are the opposite of flow variables. A stock variable is measured at a specific point in time, like Elon Musk's total wealth at 420 on a given Tuesday, or how many total people are unemployed because of his questionable business practices. Another example of a stock variable would be how much you weigh when you're measured at the doctor's office, or how much gas is in your car this very second. On a macro level, stock variables are things like national debt and total number of employed individuals right now. These variables fluctuate all the time. Remember, that's why we call them variables. After all, a variety is the spice of life. Some change to the measurements of our stock and flow variables is always expected, and it can be a good thing. Like, if I get a job at the donut shop down the street from my house, making more money than I did before, I spend my new income on buying even more donuts from the donut shop. I'm in turn supplying them with increased revenue so they could pay me even more updating both their donut production and my income to spend on even more donuts. Or maybe a crawler. Yeah. My income, the donut shop's revenue, and my donut consumption and donut production are all increasing. But like how too much spice can wreak havoc on my gut, too much change can throw the whole circular flow out of whack. Like after a huge round of layoffs, suddenly those households aren't receiving income, meaning they're gonna spend a whole lot less too. That means less money coming into firms, which means they have less revenue to spend on paying their employees, meaning more layoffs. Or the CEO could take a pay cut, or pigs could fly. And if that sounds bad for one company, imagine how tricky it gets when you're looking at tons of companies across a country's whole economy. Suddenly that circular flow isn't flowing quite so smoothly. The circular flow model is like chocolate and peanut butter, or chocolate and strawberries, or chocolate and marshmallow. Uh, a perfect balance is what I'm getting at. Labor, land, and capital flow effortlessly into the factor market in exchange for income, allowing businesses to create the goods and services we crave in exchange for our money. 
It's like a whole beautiful economic ballet. But like we said before, the circular flow model is only that, a model. Like a model starship or a model in a magazine. It's not totally real, or at least not as flawless as it looks. Economics is a lot messier in real life. And once we step out of theory and into reality, sometimes the circular flow gets a little stopped up. But even though things aren't always, well, model-esque in real life, an understanding of these most basic economic relationships is the first step towards getting things unclogged and back on track. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment, and, uh, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.